So without further notice, let's look into today. I know it's a lot to uh, digest, um, a lot to go over about costing, menu prices, and so forth, so on. But again, it's uh, in, in this world of this uh, color industry and restaurant, numbers are very important. We live and die by them. You can you can you can be an awesome, greatest cook, baker, so, uh, soup maker, saucier, butcher. But if you don't know how to run your numbers, uh, you might be out of a job and you're not going to uh, have your business um, up and running or keep it for a long time. Remember, uh, six months and after six months, either you, you keep open uh, the restaurant or you close it. Okay. So food costs, food costs, food costs, food costs. Okay. We're going to talk about food costs and your costs. Cost of goods sold. Cost of goods sold, you guys have them. I sent you the uh, the inventory sheet on the second tab. All all those um, information that is there is for your cost of goods goods sold. To figure out what where you're standing as far as um, your food cost uh, percentage for month end. We love month end. Month end, you got to count everything in the house, from your salt pepper shakers to your flowers to everything to uh, uh, work that is in process. Everything that is you have in your kitchen that is uh, uh, food. Okay. So food costs, here we go, equals beginning inventory plus purchases. Remember that, food costs equals beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory, okay? Beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory. In order to effectively calculate this, you need to keep inventory. Your food costs over the set of a period of time is the total value of all food items in your inventory and at the beginning of the period. Your beginning inventory plus the value of any purchases you made minus the total value of, of all food items in your inventory at the end of the period of your ending inventory. The result is your food cost, okay? This is what we live and die for. This is all the chefs in the industry. The result is your food cost, your monthly food cost. This is how we sustain our jobs, okay? The value of all the food in your uh, in, in use over the period of time, pretty much in a month, some places do it every week. For example, your inventory a week ago had a total value of 5,650. You made $1,720 worth of purchases this week. Your current inventory has a value of 4,800. How much are your food costs, right? Beginning in inventory plus purchase minus sending inventory, okay? To determine the food costs, you'll start with your initial inventory, 5,650. Then add your purchases, 1,720. Then subtract your current inventory, which is 4,800. Just like the Bible says, 5,650 plus 1,720 minus 48 equals 2,570. Uh, 20, how much, this is how much you spend on food this week, right? The food is great, service is fabulous, and the restaurant is busier than ever. But are you wondering why the bottom line isn't uh, what it should be? Check your food costs. A vital ratio a key to success is any restaurant that directly impacts profitability. A profitable restaurant typically generates 28 to 35% food costs. Those numbers are going to be there forever, guys, ever. Uh, coupled with the labor costs, these expenses consume, again, 50 to 75% of the total sales because the impact of food costs makes on an operation. Food costs are the one of the first things we examine at troubled properties beyond the bottom line, food costs also reflects an operation's food quality, uh, value provided to the customer and management scale. Okay, so let me go back to the first slide. Okay, food costs, beginning inventory plus purchases minus ending inventory. You all have two sets of inventory sheets with you, right? Okay. I'm gonna show you with you guys this first one. Here we go, okay? This is the one that I, um, in the property, we had about $50,000 worth of inventory. Oh, Miss Tia, this is where I found the chicken wings right here. $33, 10 pound case, okay? So this is everything that was in the house. All the prices were uh, updated, the pack size, cases, and back here where it says count, I would go uh, physically walk the property and count how many items and write in here with a pencil, not a pen, pencil and eraser, okay? So once everything was done, okay, it automatically summed it all up at the bottom, way at the bottom, okay? Chef? Yes. 
your inventory isn't on the screen. Okay. If we're supposed to be. It. All right. Is it now? Yes. Okay. It won't, yeah, yeah. A piece of it is there, Chef. Yep. Okay. Everything's highlighted. This is the bottom of the inventory. Okay. Let's say, um, I don't know. I'm going to put here 50,000. Right. See, total cost, total, uh, total goods is 50,000 at the bottom, right? In the bottom tab with blue or purple says totals, another tab. Okay, here we go. What I just went through in the lecture, everything's already built in this sheet right here. It's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. Okay. So let's say opening inventory, okay, um, was, let's say, 65,000. Right? 65,000. Uh, purchases, let's go 80,000. Right? Uh, credits. Um, let's say we we give away about three thousand dollars worth of food, okay? Comes burnt steaks, you name it, right? So total transfer is three thousand, um, okay? Total food sales. Let's say, you know, I, I go back to a hundred thousand dollars that we we had in sales a week. So hundred thousand divided times four is four hundred thousand dollars, right? There we go, four hundred thousand. Now it's forty thousand, right? 400,000, your food cost sitting at 23%. Let's say your sales were not as strong. Let's say you sold 250,000. What's your food cost at? 36 percent. Ooh. Yeah, that number, when uh, if it came to me, if that was me, I'd be like, Ugh. my neck, Ugh. right? I would cringe submitting those numbers to my food and beverage director or the GM, because if the food cost percent was budgeted or forecast to be at 30%, at 36%, if I run those numbers uh, one, two, three months consecutively, that means I was not doing my job properly uh, the menu was not priced accordingly. Uh, there was shrinkage. That means theft, overproduction, um, unwise spending. A slew of things could be happening in your kitchen if I submitted those numbers. However, um, Jeff, yeah. not saying like like if this happened a lot at one time, like in a couple of months span, that's bad. But like if it happened, we'll say like once once or twice in nine month span, would that be like, would you say that that's acceptable or, I mean, obviously it's not acceptable, but like, would you say that it's, I guess, for lack of a better term, okay? It could be. Uh, and again, this is, granted, this is a hotel property. So in the hotel, in the hotel, hotel industry, you got conference centers and ballrooms. Let's say a group came in, and they paid dirt cheap because that's the way the catering sales sold it to fill the rooms in the hotel property. Give away the food uh, beverage almost for free. Let's say our prices were about $120 per person average on the catering uh, banquet menus. Let's say she sold it at $50 per person at a banquet of 2000. That can have an impact on your food costs at the bottom. So if anything like that happens, if you are the hotel chef and you see those banquet events come in and that the price seems as skewed, ask questions. And they will tell you, oh, we sold it at this discount, discounted price to fill the rooms, okay? That means they sacrifice food and beverage to fill the rooms. So when that happens, get a copy of the banquet event order, cost it out, have another sheet in the back, what the true food cost will be for that menu, and what's the difference, uh, price per person, uh, the way they were sold, the way it was supposed to be, and what's the price difference on the total sales? And then have that documentation with you so when you go to your food and beverage director or GM, 
you have some documentation to back you up to save your skin. Same thing. But in the wouldn't restaurant. they know? Huh? Like, wouldn't they know that that's what happened? They will know that, but they will mm -hmm. still every month you're accountable for food cost, and they'll say they may, for instance, you're steadily running 30.5, 31, everything's lovely. Then one month they sell three huge events for 30, 35 percent less than they should sell them for food events. They're happy they were able to get the get the groups to go for the deals because uh, they still came in and bought a whole bunch of rooms at a time when you weren't going to sell many rooms otherwise. So it did give the hotel money. So essentially, the hotel is being financed upon the back of the chef, the food service operators, right? So you just have to know what's going on. So when you see a party come through your desk like that, and it's it's a eighty dollar a person party, and they sold it for forty five dollars a person, and it's two thousand people, you recognize there's a lot of money there that you did not receive for the food that you for the effort and the food that you produce. So it is going to raise your food cost. And they will do that, and they will know they're, they're doing that. They need to know that you know they did that. And that's why you have that documentation Chef Miguel is talking about. Let me put that into the freestanding restaurant. Same concept. Your food cost is 36%, and it's supposed to be 28 Okay. So it's just like a, a, a check the checker kind of thing? Be like, hey, right. yeah, I know you did this. Here's documentation showing that I was tracking it. CYA, cover your okay. assets. <laughs> it's not, it's kind of, it's kind of tricky to slippery slope to start, stay, start saying stuff like, I know you did this. I uh -huh. mean, in the end, you're the chef of the hotel. You're not the chef of uh, Chef Miguel Kingdom or Chef Gary Kingdom, right? That, you, that, that was in the brain kind of talk. Like, yeah, bro, I got you. I see you. Obviously, I wouldn't say that. Like, I, I know what you did. No, I know, I, I know what you're saying, but the the point is, what you had the, the diplomatic way to say a chef is a politician more than you realize, and a chef has to be able to say we are happy for that business. We know that was really good room revenue. Uh, it hurts a little bit in the food and beverage world over here because we sold that party at uh, uh, probably you know forty thousand dollars less than than it would be in normal times. But we are happy to have the room revenue. But it did. It does affect uh, you know food costs because the party took a lot less food and beverage dollars in than, than a similar party usually would. So just you just kind of saying them. You're saying I know what's going on here, without saying I know what's going on here. I'm just telling you there are folks that will put you in a corner, and if you can say it right, they kind of have to back off and give you your space a little bit. So let me let me translate that to the freestanding restaurant. Okay, to your establishment, your your budget is a uh, uh, forecast is thirty percent, right? You have steaks, you got salmons, you got chicken, you got cheesecakes, chocolates, what have you not? Um, and I hate to use this, but I'm gonna use it anyways. During Lent, okay, people don't want to eat steak, right? The Lent times, they want they don't want to eat steak. Catholics don't want to eat steak. They want to go for seafood, and you know they can't eat meat and so forth, so on. So let's say you have an, an epic church crowd or the whole entire month, your customers are not eating your steaks or your chickens. They're going for the uh, lower items. And you get one of those groups, maybe from um, uh, their are on the budget, a 20 top, a 10 top, or a bus load that comes in and uh, drops them in front of your door. They're going to come in, they're on tight budget. You have um, beverages like water with lemon, wedges on them, right, ice. And then you have either baskets of chips and salsa at the table or dinner rolls. Guess what they're going to load up because they're on a tight budget. They are going to load up on your dinner rolls, your chips and salsa, your lemons, and your sugar packets to make lemonade because they don't want to pay that $1.50 for lemonade or $4. <laughs> they're going to use those lemons and have us extra side of lemons. And they're going to use all that sugar to sit in the middle of your table to make a lemonade themselves. That can also run your food costs high. Because those groups, um, unfortunately, they're on a budget. They don't have time to spend. They got to eat. There's a lot of them. And you see them at the restaurant, right? You see them at restaurants come in. They'll squeeze all the lemons they can get into the lemon into the water. And they'll use sugar packets equal, the Splenda, what have you not. And they'll, uh, you know, dog on the, um, the dinner rolls, the butter, the chips and salsa. And with the, when it comes to um, the server to drop, you know, to take their order, they're going to go, they're going to go for the, uh, the cheapest item on the menu because they already have full. Smart. They don't want to spend money. 
So, do, um, like, do you believe at that point, like cutting someone off, like I, yeah. I, like if if they're on like their tenth order of, we'll say breadsticks or something like that, like the free, like free breadsticks at Olive Garden, we'll say, if somebody's on like their tenth order of them and they still have not gotten their food, would you cut them off at that point? You can't cut them off. <laughs> You're looking at the whole if, bunch of uh, legal issues. It's taking too long to get the food to them. It's kind of hard to say you can't eat some more breadsticks. Yep. If you flat out ran out, you could say, I'm sorry, I just don't have any more. But you probably try to keep them coming until the food comes, if yeah. they're eating them. Sorry, man. You ate all of our breadsticks. It, does, right. it, it, has, a, <laughs> it has happened before. In the restaurant, you know, certain groups come in. And, you know, it can be religious, it can be whatever. They come in and they don't have the money. They'll sit on the table. You know, server will, um, the host will welcome them. They'll sit at the table. They'll ask for X, X amount of lemons and new ice water. They'll make a lemonade, drop some bread and butter. And they ask them, are you ready to order? No. The server goes back. They'll kill the bread baskets, drink the lemonade, and get up and walk out. Wow, Chef, I, that's one I haven't seen. That's interesting. It has happened. I've oh, seen it. Cool. And every time those groups come in, we cringe at the, the name of them. That has happened. So, yeah, it will happen, guys. Not every time, but again, this is some of the things why your food guys may be behind your restaurant. Maybe your uh, grill cook is, is robbing you blind from your steaks. Maybe the dishwasher is going behind your back and, and cooking some of the steaks for himself. Maybe he's making some tacos. Maybe that server is not ringing that, um, that food and say, I need this on the fly right away. So, your cooks are making it. So, there's a lot of things that could go in an establishment that can run up your food costs 36%. Again, that shrinkage. Or groups that come in and they don't eat off your regular menu, they go for the cheaper items, so they load up on your bread and butter and your chips and salsa and your lemons and sugar packets and what have you not. Those are the things that are going to make that food cost run uh, higher. So in this case, again, have your documentation. Um, you know, in the restaurant, hey, this group came in, X amount of people, they sat, they, they didn't order much, they, they killed the bread, they killed the butter, the chips and salsa, they, they went through X amount of lemons, so this is why my food cost is 36 instead of being 30%. So just got to have your documentation. You got to be on your toes every single time. You cannot let your guard down because that food cost right here, that 36% is what you live and die for in the restaurant business. If you run it once, yeah, you might get an eyebrow raised at you. Done it twice, you might get a, a slap on the hand three or four times. Mm -mm. Uh-uh. You're not a deprivation period. You got to bring that food cost down. If you don't, you're out. Uh, quick question, Chef. Are there any laws against having cameras in your um, in your storage areas or in the kitchen, specifically in Texas? Do you nope. guys know? Nope. Okay. Yeah, I, I expect there won't be. Um, my my work, my actual kitchen production work was almost almost all uh, before the days of all the surveillance and cameras and stuff that we have now. Uh, Mercedes, although five years ago I did open a new fancy retirement community, uh, those guys had camera everywhere. I mean, I checked inside my pants a couple times, inside my jacket, I was afraid there was a camera in there, you know. Um, just kidding about that. But it, it doesn't seem like anybody's telling them they can't do it. There, okay. there's, there's a great restaurant that I used to go in uh, Norman, Oklahoma. It's a little Mexican restaurant it's called Tarahumaras, and the guy that ran it, a very, very successful, small place, always packed. Great food, awesome service. He had cameras at the hostess stand, the cashier, the bar, the dining room, all over the dining room, in the kitchen, prep area, uh, outside of the cooler, in the, in the back dock, in the parking lot. He was, um, he was conducting business from his home, from his cameras, because if, it's, if he saw somebody waiting too long in the hostess stand, he will alert or call it, uh, the, the manager, whoever's in charge, hey, Hey, this person with this t-shirt, this dress, they waited too long. What's the holdup? Or you could see that somebody was, um, their water was empty at the table number six. He will say, hey, that table needs water. Oh, that table needs to be clean. So we get on him and believe it or not, successful. You walk in, two seconds, you sit down. Two seconds, you have your water served. And then your server took your order, came in, dropped your food within a few minutes. They clean up. And then by the time you know, you were out of the door. High turnover on those tables, fast. Not fast service like McDonald's, you know, get in and get out. You went in, you sat, you enjoy your drink, you enjoy your food, and you were out in a, in, a, in a decent time. But it was all controlled because cameras all over the place, the building. 
Yeah, you know, Chef, I, I, I'm not, I can't really say that it's wrong. The person owns the business. Like if you're to get into a big philosophical thing about it, right? That the person owns the business, is responsible for it 24 hours a day, makes his or her living from it, pays everybody to come and do a job that's been described clearly to them, they've been trained, they've been shown, the expectations should be pretty clear. Is it wrong for the guy to sit there in front of the TV and then flip over to the restaurant screens once in a while to see what's up? I don't necessarily no. think it's wrong. I might not like it, but I don't necessarily think it's wrong. Mm -hmm. No. Nope. You know, I mean, it's, it's like, business. you know, yeah, I mean, you're the hostess. And um, I know that we can't be perfect, but, uh, you know, the person's been there 40 seconds in the front door looking around and nobody's even acknowledged them yet. So I, either I need to change something or you need to focus better. If you're back in the kitchen chatting, goofing off, and if somebody's at the front door, this is extremely costly to a business. Some people get really, really frustrated and, and uh, take an attitude right away that they should not spend any money in there if the place doesn't care enough to greet him at the front door, for example, and things like that. So I, can't, I cannot say the guy's wrong. And Chef, the story you're telling is the place is extremely successful, right? So, you know, I guess it works. And then, yeah, it can be considered a micromanagement, micromanaging, you know. Uh, it can be, uh, of course, no, no, no cameras in the bathroom. But it can be considered as micromanaging. But he was very successful. And the, the employees that he um, had, he had an army of staff running back of the house. Everybody wanted to work there because they were making money. They didn't really mind the cameras. It was more of a help for them, not a hindrance, because they were hustling to turn the tables and raise the check average. Would you like a margarita today? Would you like some of PS? Get it? Yes. So high turnover, more dollars. So no cameras are, um, are great, um, and they're not against the law. I stumbled into a room once before we actually opened the retirement home that I described a minute ago. I just was in, the, the place wasn't open yet and the electricians and the uh, cable and tech people were the finishing the small things and the trim and the painting was going in. We're about two weeks from opening and I walked into a small room, just got to grab the wrong doorknob and the room should have probably should have been locked but it wasn't locked and I walked in there and there's a chair in there and I don't know, about, about 20 monitors about 20 monitors in there with the, com the, the, the computer server and all that kind of stuff. You could watch at least 20 locations at one time, and I'm sure each of those monitors probably had four or five camera angle choices you could hit as well. So that you could, you could watch everything in the place in there. Well, I don't really necessarily agree with that much surveillance. There's a lot that kind of bugs me about that, but I, I can tell you guys that it's a reality. I saw it five years ago, and I doubt it's getting any less. So anyways, um, food costs, that's what we live and die for. Uh, it happened once, might get an eyebrow raised at you, it happens twice, might get a slap on the hand three or four times, your head might roll. You gotta keep those numbers down. And what I just went to describe to you guys, it's all right there on the second tab. You guys have it. It will come in handy. Maybe in a different setting, different location, maybe different systems, but the concept's still the same, okay? Still the same. Isn't that a beautiful thing? You guys already have it. <laughs> so that's it. Food gas, right? Food gas. Okay. So check your food gas again. Uh, vital ratio key to success. Any restaurants directly impacts profitability between 18, 20, and 35 because 70 percent of your cost is coming from food costs and labor costs. The spot is important. Many restaurants managers do not calculate food costs correctly, or if they do. They do not fully understand the process. To be useful, food cost percentages must be determined accurately. Then the ratio can be compared to industry averages and previous performance. With an accurate food cost steps, the steps can be taken to improve the operation and ultimately help your savings and improve the bottom line. Remember, the bottom line, your P&L statement is 20% of um, your sales. That should be taken home. But if your food costs and labor costs are a lot, lo lot lower than 30%, then your bottom line can go increase, okay? With the an um, food costs, again, uh, follow step by step of how to calculate the food costs. Here we go. So a calculated food costs. Keep in mind, if you want to eventually compare your food costs with industry averages, how you determine the numbers must be consistent with industry practices. The industry standard is based on the uh, uniform system of accounts, USAR, okay, restaurants. 
a handbook available from the National Restaurant Association. This system clearly identifies what items are included in each part of the food cost formula and is briefly outlined below. Food cost equals cost of food sales divided by food sales. Cost of goods, just like the recipe cost cards. We all costs divided by re retail cost. Okay. General guidelines establish a specific time period for analysis. The food sales and costs should be generated during a set of accounting time period of at least two weeks or more typically every 28 days. Every month, we call those month-end inventories because every month you got to submit your P&L statement. You got to know where you're standing. You can't be like Daniel from barbecue sauce, not knowing how much money is coming out and not knowing how much money is going out. Juices, coffee, soda suppliers, and other non-alcoholic beverage sales are included in food cost calculations. Those consider food costs. If it's alcohol, that's not food, uh, food uh, so don't include them in it, okay? So time frame, with your account or manager, set up a regular time frame to finalize food costs. It is critical that the elements of food costs, calculations, sales, inventories, and purchases are representative of this time period. So what do you guys think it'll be the best time to run uh, your inventory in your restaurant? What time of the day will be best to uh, take uh, count everything? Before the start of the shit and like uh, first thing in the morning, early, early, yeah, wait, say early morning, place opens. Before it opens or after it closes? Early, early morning. Early before. Okay. In, um, in the restaurant industry, it's, it's either, um, um, the day, especially in the bars, the bars is right after closing because they close at two o'clock in the morning. So the bar managers, the bartenders, they typically going home like around five or six in the morning. Unfortunately, it happens. Okay. In the kitchen, yes, before it opens. So if you open at six in the morning, guess what? Your little hiney better be in the kitchen 2 a.m. with a pencil and paper counting inventory. Yeah. Before that's, a, that's your least favorite day of the month in a weird way. It, it, usually in a small, uh, like a medium restaurant, medium sized restaurant that is very busy and has a pretty heavy inventory. Two people, if they're highly organized, might have to really hustle three, four hard hours. You're probably still counting the last couple of things when the cooks walk in at seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's a lot. And then and then what? In those days, you would sit and extend all those in one at a time with a calculator, like with a ten key calculator. Uh, today, you would you would uh, ex enter them into a uh, Excel sheet, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. So two o'clock in the morning. So if you close at twelve o'clock midnight, go home. Close your eyes and come back at two o'clock in the morning to count everything before your line coach start coming in at six in the morning. Be that clopin. Been there, done that. It ain't fun. Okay. Yeah. So before uh, it opens, chef. Yes. You might as well stay there. Yes. You might as well sleep in your car at that point. And I, 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 I was never. Um, I've never been able to um, stay in my car and sleep because the places that I worked at, they were like within less than a mile to mile radius when I was doing inventory. So I would go home, get a couple, get a power a cat nap, take a shower, come back. If I was working as late as midnight, I might just do kind of what uh, I guess was James said. Um, I might, I might just, you know, try to come in at six p.m. instead of uh, yep. you know, noon or something. So you have a, you start later, you work later, you have one really weird day. It messes up your sleep schedule for a couple of days, but then you get back in routine pretty quick. So. I might just like finish the line shift at, you know, finish the kitchen shift at 10 or 11, get my produce ordered and stuff and just stay right there and get it done. Uh, but there's different approaches to it. There's different ways to, to look at it. Yeah. Whatever it works. What is that like? Huh? Is that like 12 on 12 off or what is the? Well, I'm just saying if you normally work from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m., you're the chef, chef and you should see the lunch line get started and you should see that close and see the dinner line get started and see that they're in good shape. Uh, uh, you know, you might change your world up that day. You, maybe you don't come in at 10 a.m. Maybe you come in at noon or one, and then and then you work till uh, work till the line is closing at 10 p.m. And right around 10 o'clock, when they're closing, you can start counting right away. Right? You can tell them, look, I, I want anything, any any stuff you want to move. I want it moved up to the line and stuff before you close because I'm going to be in the walk-in closing. I don't want the inventory to change after I start counting. So maybe right away at 9.30 uh, or 9, 9 o'clock, 9.30, nobody's grabbing anything out of the dry storage anymore. Nobody's grabbing anything out of the walk anymore, probably. And you're just in there counting, and maybe you're done at 2 a.m. 
You know, you go home, you sleep late, and tomorrow's another day. You'd come to work and life goes on. So you can't do that. But yeah, they'll throw you off with the one, that one day at the end of the month, okay? Uh, two, food sales. This is a relatively easy part. Total of the, total of the customer checks or reports on the uh, POS systems, making sure that to only include sales generated from food sources, so other than uh, food should be allocated to beverages or the income account. Remember, use the sales generated with only the, uh, the a lot of time frame. Example, food sales includes, you know, plus soda, soda and juices, et cetera. So again, the inventory that I give you guys, that I was, I was doing it, you know, I include the sales of about 100, $250,000, uh, $400,000. That include the sodas, juices, iced teas, coffee, everything that has to do with food, okay? So that's your food sales. Once you um, go to the POS system, if you got what your food sales for the, for, but for the month, it will give you that information and you can plug it in, okay? Uh, three, cost of food sales. The costs associated with food sales are compromised, are comprised of purchase and inventory levels adjustments. In, uh, in our experience, part of the calculation is something computer incorrectly, determine the amount of purchases for the time period is straightforward. Total food purchases, including uh, include delivery charges, non alcoholic beverages, example food purchase, past 28 days is 5,000. Everything that you bought, um, for your restaurant that came in your back dock with uh, invoices and our receipts, log in, and that's your food uh, cost of food sales. No. Chef, alcohol does not go into that cost. No. Alcoholic beverages don't. No. That's uh, on the other side. That's like front of house business or uh, something. That's, yeah. that's, they might call that poor cost, or they have some other small term, but it's not food. The only alcohol that becomes part of your food cost is alcohol you, you uh, transfer in from the bar in order to cook with. Okay, so like, like, like with mine, the batter I'm using for the mozzarella sticks and the onion rings, uh, I would have to cost out that beer. Yeah, well, you'd you'd uh, transfer the bar, the beer in from the bar, and they would say, okay, you know, a quart of, uh, you know, two quarts of Lone Star is two seventy five or whatever that number is. Yeah, and that'd be that'd be uh, uh, your your cost of that beer, and there might be wine and other stuff too. And if you're doing that stuff on a very regular basis, like you just do the same thing every day, the same two quarts of Lone Star, the same yeah. half bottle of white wine, then after a while, you'll probably just get in the habit of knowing exactly how much how much bar transfer there is on white wine, how much bar transfer there is on beer and things like that. And other stuff like a bottle of brandy, a bottle of bourbon, a bottle of tequila for the kitchen to cook with, that stuff you probably transfer in when you get it and you put the exact number, dollars number into your transfer so that at the end, you have a bar transfers number. So that's all the money that the kitchen is spending on alcohol for cooking. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Chef. Yeah. Yeah, so no alcohol, it's just food. Okay. And uh, again, go back to the first week. Um, the information that I sent you guys, one of them was the food cost tracker. Do you guys remember that one? Like I said, I love spreadsheets. Uh, yes, Chef. I've, I've been using it. The food cost tracker, it's the one that uh, you log in the invoices, the invoice number, the date, and whatever date, uh, to whatever vendor, you plug in how much that invoice was. And it gives you your total food um, purchase for the month. And at the far right-hand side of the tab, you can plug in your sales after the next morning when you come in. And it'll give you your, uh, what we call the raw food cost on a daily basis. Let me see if I can find it. I'll tell you guys what that one was. So I know there was, there's been a lot of um, information that I, say, I share with you guys. Here we go. Let me see if I can share. Okay. This one right here. Remember that one? Food cost tracker, left hand side, name of the purveyor, okay, invoice date, invoice number, and how much was spent on that invoice. At the bottom tab, all the way down to day 28 of day 30. And then here on this sheet, it'll tally how much you have spent, and all you have to do is plug in your sales, and then automatically give you your food costs, raw food costs on a daily basis.
It's all there, guys. It will come in handy. One of these days, you're going to say, what was that he gave us that day? What was it called? Do you have it? Equally important and often not included in the determining the cost of sales uh, is inventory adjustment. Many restaurants consider only purchase in determining food cost. Does not create an accurate food cost percentage depending on that day purchases are made with a, the, a cutoff date uh, is for including sales on the, on the food cost calculation. Your food cost could appear five to six points higher or lower than it is. Additionally, discrepancies make it really difficult to compare uh, track um, food cost. Okay. So with this one is, again, many restaurants consider only purchases to determine the food cost. You can't, okay? It does not create an accurate food cost. You need your sales, you need uh, your total inventory. Uh, the food cost tracker is going to give you that raw food cost. For example, suppose you receive, purchase all your dairy and meat products on Thursday to prepare for the weekend. Remember, we're talking about the salmon, enough to last you for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and possibly Monday. Remember that? Okay. So the time period for determining the food cost ends on Friday, the next day. Okay. Calculating your food cost, it appears much higher than last month. While the increase may be due to the uh, theft or another operational issues, it is most likely due to calculating your food cost inconsistently and correctly. Your purchase reflect a large storage of delivery. However, that do not log the sales for the, week, uh, the weekend to offset these purchases. Make sure your food costs appear on the line. Additionally, you have no factor in the inventory adjustment. What this is telling you guys, if Thursday is your month in, okay, Go ahead and count the inventory, right? Count it, but that drop of salmon you receive on Thursday for Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, do not include it in your purchases for the, the month that just ended. Push that invoice for the next month, which is the next day over. Otherwise, your food inventory is gonna be inflated and your food cost is gonna be lower. You're gonna have good numbers, but the following month is gonna catch up to you. A lot of chefs do this. They'll buy, they'll wait till the last day to run the inventory a little bit lower and then make that order, they get that product, they put it in the inventory, but it's not gonna be utilized until the next day, next month, it'll inflate their inventory. This is what we call cooking the books. Right, Chef Gary? <laughs> I disagree with the whole premise of that slide, Chef. I can't, I can't, uh, I cannot endorse it. Right? <laughs> So if I buy salmon on Thursday, if I spend 400 bucks on salmon on Thursday and the, and the period ends Friday, and I'm not gonna sell it until uh, Saturday and Sunday and so forth, well, when the period ends, I know that I just spent 400 bucks on salmon on Thursday, but I'm also gonna count the 400 bucks on salmon on Friday. So it's not been shown as used up. It's not been shown as, as a food expense in that month. So I don't think that slide's correct. I don't know who wrote that. I, can't, I cannot endorse it. So you can push it for the next day because you're not using it on Thursday. You still need to have ready for lunch on, on Friday. So you can hold that invoice, not hold it to the end, but don't pl plug it in and plug it in on the next day. And it'll balance, it'll be balanced out. Nothing to say, Chef. Yeah, all right. <laughs> so then get two sides of the story. When I when I used to um, have my F&B, it's like, yeah, well, and I will tell them, you know, hey, I, I, it's month in, but I gotta have the product. How's it gonna fix it? I just hold the invoice, you know, put it on the next day and submit it. Uh, it works, it depends, okay? So determine how inventory adjustment, realizing the time energy that I counting inventory on the line in production, remember everything has to be counted, is prohibited to include inventory and food cost calculations. It is recommended to estimate production inventory level. Conduct inventory of the dining room, service in production areas as few times. Average the inventory levels and use them to constant figure each time period. And uh, add the, uh, the estimated figure on the physical counter in storeroom inventories each period for your end inventory. It's important to update your production inventory level at least once a year. So in the yes. dining room, you got sugar, yes. salt, creamers, pepper. So you can count it once. And if it's, if it's kept at the same day in, day out, that doesn't change, uh, tally it up. And you don't have to count that stuff every single month. Use that number. Like Chef, that's one. exactly right. And in fact, you can even you can even use that trick in your kitchen. I have a spice rack of maybe 120 various bottles of stuff in my kitchen. I am not going to go through and count one third of a bottle of nutmeg and calculate how much that is, and one quarter of a bottle of cinnamon. 
I am not going to do that. I'm going to count those spices about two, three months in a row. And I'm going to see that one, one day I had 750 bucks worth of uh, spice rack. And the next month I had 680. The next month after that I had 780. I'm going to add them up and average it and bang. That is my number for spices. Every time I count my kitchen, I got 745 bucks of spices. I'm going to assume. If I'm wrong by 20 bucks because the average is not right because I didn't buy that box of cinnamon this week, well, I got bigger fish to fry than a $20 bill in an operation that has 50,000 in inventory. I just don't give a hoot about that 20 bucks. That's a very good trick and it'll save you about 40% of your counting time. Yep, that 20 bucks is not gonna make a uh, yeah. Is it different for things like saffron or vanilla beans that are more expensive than most? Well, that should be kept on the chef's office. Stuff like you could choose to, okay, fine, I got, I, got, uh, I got $180 worth of saffron here. You could say, well, you know, that won't, I won't lump that with the other stuff. I'll just count that each time. If, if that $100, the possible $100 up or down on saffron, if that bugs you so much and you can't sleep and it's causing you to drink, okay, good, count it. <laughs> I, I would That's not, a couple I mean, of handles right there, that 100 <laughs> If I have somewhere between 50 and 100 bucks worth of saffron, I'm just going to say 75 bucks every month. I'm going to do the same thing that I did with the cinnamon and all that stuff because the money is in 500 bucks with the tenderloins and 200 bucks with the pork tenders and 400 bucks with the salmon. And, um, you know, that's where the money is. The $20 bills, you don't want to waste them and you wouldn't disregard them, but you can average them and, and, and spend more time counting accurately and probably be a better manager. Just like all the salt and pepper and sweet loaves and all that junk in the dining room, it's kind of the same principle. Save the time counting. Assume a certain number every month. Write that number in there. Call it good. Okay. Here on this inventory, there is a slot for the chef's office. Let me see if I can pull it up. Sweet shop. The chef's office where we kept all the uh, expensive items that were not in the kitchen. Your vanilla beans, your um, uh, alcohol, your liquor, all those kind of things. Let me see if I can find it. But there was a, there is a slot, say a chef's office, or a special loader products. And you can keep those, like I said, if those are gonna be more expensive and uh, if you wanna count them, then go ahead and put them in the, um, in the inventory, but keep them locked up. You talking about like the five dollar stuff, like a saffron, vanilla bean, right. things like that? Some really super, super truffles and things like that, I guess, yeah. Right, see like here, we had um, alcohol, cooking, sherry, Madeira, sake, bourbon, port, brandy, amaretto, marsala. They were transferred to the kitchen. We didn't go and count them in the liquor room. We had them in the chef's office. So the chef's office included these items, but they were already uh, allocated to the food costs. Those you had to count. So those you, you kept them and the, the, locked up in the cage on the, in the office, and you counted them as you went. Mm -hmm. What else? Yeah, there's only a couple of things that uh, we, we used to keep in the chef's office. Again, the saffron that can be kept locked up, you don't have to keep it on the spice rack because otherwise there would be mis misuse and then you're going to be running a higher food cost. So you, again, you're going to think that it's going to be there and it's not going to be there. Okay. So uh, now that you have your ending inventory uh, level, look at the uh, change from the beginning, start of the period of time, inventories, uh, kitchen and storerooms. The key to accurate cost determination is understanding the whole inventory levels. For example, the beginning inventory is at a value of 100, and four weeks later, the ending inventory is 75. The inventory adjustment is $25 difference. An increase in cost of food sales because you uh, use 25 worth of inventory, did not replace it with new purchases. Inventory in, in industry, it's, it's best to try to keep it at that, uh, that safe level. If you go too low on your inventory, it's gonna drive your food cost percentage up. If you go too high in your inventory, it's going to drop your food cost percentage low. Just as it can question, why is your food cost percent at 34%, they can also question, why is your food cost percent at 18%? Something is wrong. So you got to keep it within 28 to 32% at all times. Try to keep it at that number because if you go too low, it's going to hurt you at the end of the month, at the next month, because then you're going to have to buy more product to keep it, keep your restaurants open and sustainable. And it's going to go towards your purchases. I mean, your purchases are going to be sky as it can be a little bit higher this month because you have to refill your inventory. So, word of advice: trying to keep that inventory at a somewhat floating level, 28, 32. Uh, I mean, that dollar amount. Don't uh, don't go too low. Don't go too high. Okay. 
Consider this change and its effect on the cost of food sales. Apply the difference to the total purchase for the time period, giving you the total cost of food sales. So cost of food sales, again, purchases plus uh, minus inventory, adjustment. Add if, if beginning inventory, ending inventory. So track the beginning inventory, ending inventory. Per example, purchase 500. Beginning is uh, 750, ending is 625. This is simple math that you guys have it on your sheet. It's already done for you. It's already built. Okay. All this, it's already in there. That's the, so the it says purchases 500 beginning inventory 750. So the 250 was what was left at the end of the month that you added to. Correct. Okay. So for food cost percentage, the final step, putting the numbers together. Uh, so food cost equals cost of food sales divided by food sales. Example, 625 divided by 1850 is at 33.8%. That's already built in in your food cost tracker, the one I just showed you. You just gotta log in your invoices and gotta log in your daily sales and it'll automatically give you this, this number. You don't have to go pencil and paper if you don't want to because it's already there. Now you have the basic steps to complete your own food costs accurately and consistently with the uh, industry practices. Um, how you can use a food cost percentage. The next step requires uh, compiling the sales and cost consistently and regularly and, and as, as comparisons to previous performance uh, can uh, prove very helpful, helpful. Identifying problems and trends. Remember that the decrease in food costs is an important invest to investigate as an increase. Like I said, if it's too low or if it's too high, you got to investigate why is it too low? I come, okay? Uh, from here, your operation is positioned to tighten their food costs by standardizing recipes, evaluating purchasing systems, and taking other steps to create a target food cost for your particular restaurant. With the ultimate goal that is uh, a positively imp impacting your bottom line, so for profit's sakes, inventory your food costs. Now, I've taken over uh, places where the inventory was too high and the food cost was 2% two, two was too high. And again, the, the goal was to reduce it to um, comfortable levels and make sure that the food cost, everything recipe was costed out and the menu was priced out accordingly to generate the proper food cost, okay? Common food and labor cost percentages. If you're running a restaurant or food service business, you understand that the most important costs under control are food, including beverages like soda, juice, coffee, tea, and labor costs together, known in the industry as prime costs. Being able to compare these costs in a percentage format against typical scenarios for other restaurant businesses is helpful to management in your business. You gotta be on top of your numbers. Costs vary widely with the type of restaurant. Both food and labor costs vary widely with the type of food service operation. As a rule, luxury restaurants will have a higher food, food and labor cost percentages in the casual dining and fast food restaurants. The uh, luxury restaurants will have will be running at about 34% food costs. Okay, the product sales mix, quality food and service, pricing, and hours of operation will impact your food and labor costs percentages. Furthermore, state minimum wage differentials and differences in tip credit allowances too uh, affect labor costs percentage. The extent of beverage sales as part of the food mix has a considerable impact on total food cost percentages. Uh, how food labor costs calculated? Uh, food and labor costs are calculated as a percentage of total volume of sales. If a restaurant does $20,000 a week and the total cost of food and beverage is $7,000 for that week, then the food cost is considered 35%. If at the same time, uh, same restaurant, labor including payroll, taxes, and benefits equal to $5,000 a week, then the labor cost is at 25%. Total prom costs are 60 for this example. So if we generated 20 cents, 20,000 a week, and 7,000 um, for that week, then you're looking at 60%, okay? What are the ranges? Certain fast food restaurants can achieve labor costs as low as 25%. We started with 24%, but you can drive it a little bit lower than that if you want, but just don't kill your staff. While table service restaurants are more likely to see labor in a 30% to 40% range, depending on the menu and the extensiveness of the service. Food costs, including beverages for the restaurant industry, run typically between 28 to 35% range, depending on the style of restaurant and the mix of sales, especially you have your large liquor inventory, your primes, your wells, all that goes in it. Look at prime cost to determine success. In order to make money in the restaurant, 
business prime cost should generally be in the 60 to 65 percent range. How that breaks down uh, between food and labor is less important than achieving a prime cost maximum that produces satisfactory profits. So if one of the prime costs is the higher range, the other prime cost must be the lower range to achieve profitability. Remember, it's a combination of food and labor that creates the bottom line. Bottom line is what you're looking for. So cost calculations, restaurants and food service industries are businesses. They have to be able to make a profit or make money over the cost of food, so they have to pay employees, electric costs, insurance, building and equipment maintenance. Chefs and bakers must be aware of food cost calculations, even if you're not the one doing the counting. In the industry, you know, us as the chefs, we are very, very um, uh, territorial and protective of any food that goes into waste. Uh, we don't want to see any, any, any food goes into waste because that means your food cost goes high and jobs are at stake. Okay. So again, we went over that yesterday, EPSAP. Uh, okay, pretty much the same thing. Uh, your percentage. This is a one example too. Prime rib roast. The prime rib roast uh, said at 30 is AP cost as purchased, three dollars per pound. That's kind of cheap. My estimate it should be like around 14 bucks a pound. To purchase 40 pounds uh, as purchase, it costs the following: so three dollars. Per pound times 40, it's about 120. That's about right. Well, no, it's not. It's the price is too low. So, anyways, uh, prime rib roast of the trimming, the edible portion of the yield is 20, 20 pounds. So, 20 pounds or 50% or half of that to determine the product yield percentage. Why? Because you need to get rid of the fat cap, French the bones, and trim of that the excess um, uh, silver skin. So, yield percentage EP, 20 pounds. Uh, divided by AP, 40 pounds, it's a, a equals 0.5 times 100. You lose about 50%. So 120 cost for 40 pounds. Uh, 20 pounds yield is what's left at the trimming. So six pounds, I mean six dollars a pound. So three dollars at the beginning, but at the trimming, you gotta that's the butcher's yield. You gotta include that in. So you, now your uh, your cost of that 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 steak, the uh, rib roast, is six dollars per, per pound because you gotta estimate and price and charge for the, the trim you're generating. Even though you're gonna serve it maybe in a stew, stock, or demi or whatever, you gotta also charge for that one. So when you're charging, you're costing out a recipe, cost it at $6 per pound, okay? Is this the same thing as ribeyes? Yep, same thing as ribeyes. Uh, this is uh, ribeye. Rib also called a war glove, not a tomahawk. Tomahawk is when the rib is extra, uh, is left on a, the whole rib. And it's like, oh, okay. about, it's about 78 ounce, um, I cut a steak. It takes about 45 minutes to cook meat and bread. Yeah. So bone and ribeye, also known as a work love. Um, the whole rib, I mean the whole bone is tomahawk. Okay. So anyways, costing your divide, um, the AP price uh, by the yield percentage decimal to determine the AP cost. Again, EP, EP, AP uh, per unit divided by yield percentage. AP price $3 divided by 50% equals six dollars a pound that's an easy way to go about it easy way okay the actual cost for prime to serve the guests is six dollars per pound so six dollars you want to do a rib roast for your guests you can charge them a six dollars a pound and then on your recipe cost card cost it as such the yield percentage uh percent is used to determine the amount of food uh, to purchase and determine the actual cost to serve the food to a guest this calculation is critical to the success of food service operation. Makes sense. Go ahead. Somebody had a question? Okay. Food versus money ways. Let's take a look at this video, guys. I'm gonna pop in the link on the chat. Take a look at it real quick. Okay. Uh, Where is it? Hold on, let me, let me go look for it. Okay. It's a, it's a good video, guys. So you got to take a look at it. It only takes a few minutes. Okay.
Come on. Let's see if I can find it. Is that it right there, Chef? Uh, food wasted, money wasted? Yeah, I'm trying to look for it. Oh, I see. It's because it's like a, on your screen. I can't really grab the link, right? No, I can't. No. It's a good video, too. Let me see if I can pull it up here. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. Not letting me copy this one. There we go. It's a minute and a uh, half long. Okay, guys, it's really it's real fast to watch. I'm gonna put it in the chat. Go watch it. Okay. There you go. That's what I see when I'm in the kitchen cooking. That's what we all see in the kitchen when we're cooking. Kind of gross. <laughs> but isn't it true, though? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a personification, I guess, of what's really going on. That's awesome. <laughs> Think about nice it. Nice out on those dollar bills. Pretty good. <laughs> I also <laughs> like them cutting those coins. Nice in the coins. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it, guys. Everything that is, you come to your back door is money being spent, right? So everything that you um, order is money. Everything that you put in your cooler, freezer, dry storage is money. Everything that you put in your cutting board is money. Everything in the chop, dice, saute, roast, sear, grill is money. Everything that goes on those plate is money. Everything that comes back that doesn't get eaten, it's money going to the trash. First time I saw it, I was like, what the fuck, uh, really? But it's money. It's money. Like I said, we as uh, uh, chefs, um, you know, aside from the recipe, the technique, and, and you know, having a, an awesome experience with food, um, our antennas are always, always up. Even when you, um, uh, you know, use the last drop of the olive oil from the container, you know, um, always trying to squeeze the last drop out of it if you can. Even when you have a mist cup and you use it for olive oil, um, you know, setting up, and you're going to go rinse the miska, make sure you scrape that olive oil off the miska and save it because that can be another um, part of a recipe for dressing. Again, that's money. What are we doing foundations? What did I really try to emphasize really hard in foundations that that a lot of times had to do with money? They, they, Scraping the last bit of clarified butter or stock or, or anything uh, out of a pot, putting it into a, that, into a plastic container. Yes, that rubber spatula thing, getting all the ketchup, getting all the mayonnaise, getting the last of that sauce and so forth. And then also, if you're throwing uh, something in the dish pit that has a lot of food in it, uh, you trash your dishwater, you change your dishwater more, you go through more chemicals, your soap is ruined faster because you've got a bunch of fat floating in there. So, I mean, it really is kind of stunning. It, it, seems like, it seems like nickels and dimes, but actually, if an operation has great habits versus crappy habits on scraping catching all the usable stuff and keeping the the the, the crap out of the dish tank area uh that adds up to lots and lots of money um in the course of a year it could literally for a small operation it could literally or a big one it could be the difference between making the rent and making it or not it could be the difference between the 200 bucks worth of new saute pans you need to make your Friday nights go a little smoother or not. That's a great little clip there, Chef. Yeah, it's money. <laughs> it's money, everything from a drop of olive oil to heavy cream to milk to flour. You know, how many times do we use flour to make bread or baguettes or um, in the recipe and you have all this flour coming on your table and you get to scrape it up from the trash? That's money. So when you guys so, go back, I just yeah. want. Go ahead. Who that? Sound like Mercedes, but oh. couldn't tell. So I nicknamed my spatula the Million Dollar Spatula. I use it to scrape every little bit I can. That's pretty good. I like that. That's money. Yeah. Money. So anyways, go back to your percentage again. Um, EP divided by AP equals your percentage, 75%. Okay. We're going to skip up this, this practices right here because we went through them yesterday. Okay. And then we're going to spend some time with you guys. I know it's about an hour, but it's running a little bit later than that. Okay. So calculating your costs. Okay. List all the ingredients and quantities in the formulas prepared on your recipe cost card. The Tim and uh, we're not we're not we're not, we're not going to go to the EP cost on the items. You're going to cost of the recipe straightforward. So we're not going to worry about the EP and the IP. But if you're in the uh, in the kitchen, you got to figure out these items. Okay. So determine the EP cost and the ingredient. Um, convert the quantities in the formula to the same units used for the EP costs. Calculate the total cost of each ingredient by multiplying the EP, uh, just like we went over yesterday. Add the ingredients to get a total formula cost. Your recipe cost card does that. You get the unit or portion cost. It does that as well too. Okay. So there's a lot of advantage on that one. The, the cost to purchase the food determines the cost proportion, which is directly related to the menu price. The menu price and the guest perception is its value at crucial to the success of the restaurant. 
right? Lemus terms. You want to know how I, you want to know how to buy a car? Play cost 368. Triple this for the menu price, 1104. Just like Miss Tia's chicken wings, right? Eleven dollars. And the food cost was about 33 percent. Okay. No one looks at the cents. Their eye focus on the dollar amount, eleven dollars. So it will be going notice if you change it to eleven to four or eleven ninety-five. Let's say you sell 100 dishes this day. Uh, you're open six days a week. That means $546 a week. $546 times 52 weeks per year. That dish alone is generating almost $30,000 for one menu item. Menu mix is something used in the turn to refer to the same thing as sales mix. However, menu mix also may refer to how the menu items are distributed in the kitchen during the service. Menu mix it evaluates the flu. Uh, the flow of menu items, okay? Restaurants must achieve their standard targeted food cost percentage. If a restaurant exceeds its food cost standard, profits will likely decline. Menu items sell at a variety of cost percentages. Yeah, I know. For instance, if you have a menu item which comes from the grill station satay and fry station, then ideally one third of the most popular items will come from each stations during the service. So when you assign a menu, make, make sure that the items come up uh, equally or about the same from each station. Don't bog one station up. Like give everything to the pantry, give everything to the grill, divide it up. This even the distribution of production in the kitchen facilitates speed of service. Conversely, if 70% of your menu items come from off the grill and 30% of your other two stations, then your grill station will constantly be slammed and speed of service will be slow. And now your customers are eating the heck out of the bread and butter or chips and sauce at the table, right? No. What is a sales mix menu? Evaluation of your theoretical food costs based upon total items sold for a given period and compares with the, uh, that, with the margin generated from those items. The goal is to measure and compare the vital pieces of information. Your food cost percentage based upon the item sold and the margin net profit as compared against cost of goods. Uh, chefs, we often uh, are taught that food cost percent is the end of all. The most important violation of the business success is that a misconception or a failed concept because it is only half the truth, half the picture. Sometimes a high food cost is a good thing, maybe even better than a low food cost. Sometimes, I don't know. I hate to run my food cost too high. The primary goal of menu engineering is to encourage purchases, uh, purchase target items, presumably the most profitable items to, this, to discourage purchase of the last profitable items, okay? To the end, firms must first calculate the cost of each item listed on the menu. This costing exercise should be extended to all items listed on the menu and should reflect all costs incurred to produce and serve. Ultimate, ultimately, the item's cost should be included food costs, including wasted products and product loss. Incremental labor, cost of huge of house butchering, pastry production or prep, condiments and packaging, only incremental costs and efforts should be included in the item cost. Those who believe that a low uh, food cost percentage is more important than the gross profit will promote the items with uh, the lowest item cost percentage. Unfortunately, these items may are typically the lowest price items on the menu, chicken, pasta, soups, maybe some salads. Okay. So promoting only low food cost items will likely result in lowering your average check unless the restaurant attracts more customers, overall sales, will not be emphasized, optimized. Okay. Here we have festival, panini, broccoli, order 575, and then a little square, 875, 725. Low food costs and high, co high gross profit are not mutually exclusive attributes to a venue item. A second approach called cost margin analysis identifies items that are both low cost and, re and return higher than average gross profit. This item prefer as primes. Uh, there's really no single method of analyzing that it can be used as, uh, across the board on the menu items. If a menu item is commodity like hamburgers, chicken or tenders, fajitas, and other items found in the majority of restaurant menus, prices tend to be more moderate if a menu item is specially uh, and unique to the particular restaurant. And demand is high, prices can be higher than average because typically the restaurant has a monopoly on the items uh, until the competitors copy them and put them on the menus, higher prices may be charged. However, no restaurant can stand a competitive uh, uniqueness or price advantage over the competition in the long run. Eventually, competitors will try to match them. That's why you competed with each other. 
after items cost and the price um, have been determined, evaluation of an item's profitability is based on the item's uh, contribution margin. Contribution margin is calculated as the menu price uh, minus the menu cost. Menu engineering then focuses on maximizing the contribution margin at each guest orders. The recipe constant should be updated, at least in the ingredient portion cost. Whenever the menu is reprinted or whenever the items are re-engineered, some uh, simplified calculations or contribution margins include any food costs. So when you change your menus, you can go ahead and recost the recipes again, make sure you're in line with the price that you're paying, okay? And we talked about the puzzles, the docks, the workhorses, right? The stars, popular, highly contribution margin, should be a flagship or signature dish. Uh, plow horse, high pro popularity by low contribution margin, sell well, do not increase revenue significant. To the puzzles, low in popularity, you know, it can be your kids' menu items. To the dogs, they don't move. Products going bad in the coolers. So lobster with a spaghetti. To illustrate uh, that sometimes a high food cost is a good thing, you'll sell a lobster at 50% food cost and spaghetti at 30%. Your actual food cost will vary depending upon the quantities of each sold. If you sell lots of lobster, you will have a lousy food cost. But if you have uh, lots of cash, uh, you will have lots of cash. And more importantly, you have a lot more net margin cash. In examples below, 1,000 orders are served each in each case. In an example, mostly lobster. In the order, uh, in the others, mostly spaghetti. At the end of the day, you would rather have um, a 49.6 food cost percentage and $23,000 net cash, or 37 food costs and only 8,000 in cash. Mm. Even the cash, right? 14,000 more cash in the same amount of the covers. So here we go. Here we go. Lobster cost 25, sales 50, food cost 50%, yikes. Margin 25 bucks, sold 900, cost is 22. Total sales 45,000. Let's say you sold the same kind of spaghetti, cost $3, sales at 10, food cost 37%, $7. Items on the number sold 100, cost 300. So total for that is, uh, what is it, 1,000? So one is a low, one is a high. So if you sell them, if you sell them, uh, if you sell the high items, you're gonna have high food costs. So try to sell, you know, try to sell either an equally balanced or the low items more, so you can have a, a good balanced food cost at the end. Food costs versus retail costs. Food cost is the actual menu item cost in your recipes. Retail is what you will sell the item for. That lingo, retail cost, okay? How do we know what food costs uh, isn't just the, what we spend on food? Surprising, it's not that simple. Food costs for a restaurant is calculated on the percentage of what we get for that dish. Formula, food cost divided by the menu price equals recipe, food cost percentage. Another formula, food cost of sales divided by total sales equals food cost percentage. Works with beverages, cost of sales too, especially beverages. Think of a dinner party. Uh, if you know what if you paid for the food, $17.38 divided by four equals four, 434 per person. This is all there is, even if you are just serving soup. What it costs divided by how many it feeds. Uh, chefs want to know how much it costs, but also how much they can get for that dish. So we ask, what is our cost percentage of the price we charge? At a restaurant, if the food cost is $6.36 per person, you charge $19.95. So six divided by 19 equals three, uh, 31%. Okay. And this is true, guys. When we go in the kitchen, you know, when you're presenting your food, I may come up to your table and critique your food and items. And, you know, aside from the taste and presentation, I'm going to ask you, how much do you think that dish costs to make? And I've asked this before. Nick, Mercedes, Tia, right? And I've asked you this. How much would it cost to make this dish? How much will you sell it for? Always, always think. Even when you go in the kitchen, right, Mr. When you guys go back and start producing the recipes, think about not yeah. just the recipe, think about how much it costs to make it, how much will you sell it for? Get into that mode, numbers. Everything you serve to a guest needs to be accounted for. The vegetables, the starch, the sauce, all need to be part of the cost of the meal. We must know uh, what the whole dish costs, even the leaf of parsley. If you serve soup, does it have a dinner roll? Does it have a dinner roll of, with butter? All the items served with the dish must be included in the cost. For a cake, the cost of the batter, 
as well as the frosting and fondant must be taken into account. Profit uh, equals revenue. Your profit consists of your menu uh, uh, revenue minus all your costs. Combined food costs, beverage costs, labor costs, and fixed costs. This might be a negative at first, but will be categorized as a loss rather than a profit as your restaurant starts off and goes through its growing pains. Yes, growing pains, just like the terrible twos and terrible threes. The ultimate goal is to have a positive profit every month, not just a year, every month. So your total revenue last week was 9,521. Your food cost was 1,708. Beverage was 1,000. Your labor cost was 3,000. Your other costs were 2,000. So determine your profit, subtract all your costs and your revenue. Easy does it, right? Just like bouncing your checkbook. Both food and labor costs vary with the type of food service. As a rule, again, luxury restaurants run a higher um, labor. Practical application, and we went over that yesterday. So this is where we stop and where we, where we add with your recipe costing guys. This is where we dedicate the time for all of you guys. How are we looking? Um. So, Chef Gary, did you get those numbers I just sent you? Yeah. I would say we're looking beautiful. So, so, so keep the cheese sticks at the six ninety five. Well, you said they're costing you six fifty six, so you could. Oh uh, yeah, no, they're costing you one forty. So your food yeah. cost calculation said that at whatever percentage you wanted, you'd probably sell them about six fifty six. So I'm saying, well, okay, fine, go to six ninety five. Yeah. You don't have to. You could go six fifty. You'd be all right. Yeah. And okay. As far as those onion rings, no, you don't sell those them. Those things are cheap years. as crap. <laughs> Sorry? Those were cheap as crap to make. It's like a, a uh, 42 cents. That doesn't mean give them away for a buck and a half. You have a lot of challenges. Yeah. Nobody, <laughs> want, nobody expects them for a buck and a half. Sell them for what they'll bring. Okay. Yep. Um. You're coming in broken up to you. Yep. Yeah, we, yeah, we can't hear you too. at all. Is that your connection? Yeah, he's still broken. Whoever that is. Daniel said it's everybody's internet. Could be, I guess. There's some aliens outside. I'm not talking. I just in the chat. Okay.
Okay, so I just switched over to my phone. Can you hear me now? Much yeah. better. <laughs> okay. So on one of my recipes, it calls for, um, hold on, I wrote it down because I don't want to have to flip through the pages, but it calls for three cloves of minced garlic. Okay. But on the inventory sheet, it only gives me garlic by the pound. <laughs> so five pounds, right? <laughs> yes. So try to picture um, three cloves equals about one ounce, give or take. Okay. Okay. So, so that, that's kind of what I figured was one ounce. I did a half ounce, but okay. one ounce would be even better. So I just do one ounce of minced garlic. All right. So... Sure. Inventory is like a, a, it's a twenty dollars or something like close enough to twenty bucks or for a five pound uh, jug, right? Um, it's eleven dollars for a five pound for five pounds of whole garlic. So eleven so divided by five. Five is how much for one pound? And then divide that by the ounce, sixteen ounces in a pound, and you get that how much for? Uh, yeah, no, I did that already. I just didn't know like the how much three cloves of minced garlic was. About an ounce. Right. So and that ounce will be pretty close or a tiny bit off. We can't know for sure. But when you get all done, how much is that ounce going to be when you put it on your cost card? Um, it's 18 cents. So 18 cents. Yeah. So if you're wrong by six cents, nobody cares. Right? Okay. You know what I'm saying? You're going to still, you, you want your cooks to use how much do you want them to use and all. But don't worry about the five, six cents that you might be wrong this way or that on one ounce or something. Okay. And then worry, so worry, like for my for my more. red pepper flakes, it costs it calls 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 for a half of teaspoon. Call it three cents. Yeah. <laughs> That's <laughs> what I did too, but I was just like spend zero time on that. Call it three okay. cents. That's it. Because I can pull it up and, and give you the exact amount, how much that is, but it's going to be about three cents. I mean, I have I have all of that written down. I just didn't know if that's the way that I was supposed to be doing yeah. it. Somewhere, Tia, there's somebody that sits in an office and, and, and gets the exact pound price on that red pepper, and they get it down to exactly one ounce, and then they find out how many teaspoons they got when they measured when they weighed out one ounce, and they finally come out and they say, okay, one teaspoon is 1.3 cents. And I, I, I just, I, I'm glad that makes somebody happy, but I ain't doing it. And I'm pretty good at food cost. I don't spend 10 minutes figuring out something that's worth three cents or five cents or 10. It's the same thing for the ginger, but ginger's expensive, so. Good, figure it out. Maybe it's 20 cents. You know, maybe it comes to 20 cents an ounce or 30 cents an ounce. Take your wild guess, you'll be, you'll be wrong by, Three, four, five cents. Once again, nobody cares. So here, here's something that uh, some really sharp managers said to me one time, Tia. They said, spend 80% of your time managing the 20% of your product that costs you 80% of your money. Do I make sense? Yeah. Yeah. If you're spending... 10 minutes figuring out how much a little handful of garlic costs uh, and you're not spending 10 minutes making sure that you're still paying the same price for ribeyes that you were paying last month, that's a huge mistake. Don't sweat the garlic, know what the hell you're paying for the ribeyes. And know that they're not being wasted and that the portions are correct and you know all the stuff that goes along with that. Spend your time on the money. Don't spend your time on pennies too much. Okay. I'm hoping that helps somebody else that's part of this conversation. I'm assuming you guys are hearing this. I hear you, Chef. Good. Jesus fucking Christ. All right. <laughs> okay. Sorry. No, because I put it in there and I did everything and it's telling me that I would need to sell it at thirteen seventy five to get a thirty percent food cost. No what? At thirteen seventy five. Uh my chicken wings. Well go go ahead and then 
go ahead and finish it. And uh, when you um, when you uh, finish it, all the recipes, then you can price it whatever you want to sell it as. You don't have to sell it at thirty percent food cost. Because remember, you're going to have some items that are going to be in the high percent food cost, and going to be the lower percent food cost in your menu mix. The overall food cost in the entire menu is what is going to be uh, looked at upon. Also, Tia, did you figure the cost of the batter that you're going to use to fry those wings? Are you using a batter? No, no batter. Okay. Did you figure up a mix of seasoning? I guess you must have. Yeah, that's, yeah. There's, there's, there's a lot seasoning. of stuff. Okay. There's a lot of stuff in it. And I mean, in that little, like, orange juice is costing me $1. fifteen. For how much orange juice? For two ounces of orange juice. Yeah, it's not right. It's not right. You got a math error right there. Take a new look at your orange juice price that you're paying and see 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 if you're paying for concentrate or what. You might have some kind of a something you didn't think of in there. James, we got yours too. I, I'm, I'm, I was looking at it too. Yes, I'm about to check on it as well. Yeah. So um, you said you did. You did just get it, Chef, and you're mm -hmm. looking at it. Right. Okay. A dog yapping or what? What's that noise? <laughs> so that's the stupid dog next door to my house. That's a cat. <laughs> yeah. Is Chef Miguel on this inventory before I kill my eyes scrolling down this screen to look for orange juice? Is there more than one orange juice? Uh, concentrate in the freezer. Yeah, no, this one wasn't in the freezer. The one that I found wasn't in the freezer. It was under juice. Tia, yeah. in the, uh, so how, how do you have your, uh, do you have it pulled up on uh, full screen mode or is it like half screen? What, have what pulled up? The inventory sheet. Oh, it has, it's on full screen. I see it right here. I was gonna say, um, do you have it pulled up in sheets or like Chef Miguel where it's like an actual spreadsheet? Um, it's in, she uh, fuck, I don't know. Sheet, sorry. Okay, um, easy way to find something is go uh, in like the top right corner 
on that uh, spreadsheet, there should be three little dots going vertically. Click on those three little dots and you should be able to uh, see something that says find and replace and type in a very, very vague description of what you're looking for. Okay. Oh, wait, hold on. Shoot. And then in the, uh, then right where those dots would have been, there should be arrows and it should tell you how many items include something of that description and then you can look for it that way. Okay, thank you very much. Absolutely. I know it's a pain. I, I, I suffered through it for like five menu items and I'm like, oh my goodness, this has to be an easier way to do it. So I started playing with it. Yeah, because I'm like, this is going to drive me nuts. <laughs> Did you, you said you shared, are you talking about you shared your food costs with me? Yes, Chef. I shared the food cost with you. It should be named uh, DLC food cost or something like that in a mm -hmm. Google document. Yeah, I had to search for it. If you had it uh, from your Google email, I would be searching for it. Oh, no, no, no. I sent it from, because uh, I, I, all my documents that I saved go to uh, my other drive. So it's from the JS Morgan. That's I'm what I'm sorry. saying. Right? Yes, Chef. Okay. Bob's ravioli. It's costing me one one thirty five, James, for the for the whole plate. No, that's not mine, Chef. That's uh, oh. I, I haven't deleted that one out. Mine is all the ones down the bottom. Mine is the grand dinner. That's the that lobster ravioli is uh, Chef Miguel's still. Okay. Yeah, yours is the grand dinner. I'm on the grand dinner. No, mine is not the grand dinner, Chef. Oh, yours is what again then? Mine is everything else but the grand dinner. Okay. Okay, you got a bunch of sheets. I think. Yeah, a bunch of sheets. Okay. I don't believe your lettuce is only costing you two cents, but we might be arguing over... I mean, that might be worth an argument because I don't think you're getting that lettuce for two cents. Your tomato is two tenths of an ounce. And your tomato is only a penny. Yeah, your math is, you got, you got to work on your math here. You need to figure out how much a tomato costs you and figure out how many slices you're taking out of that tomato how many slices you're gonna use is gonna be something more like 10 cents or 12 or something like that. So if you're talking about three or four times 10 cents, that, that is an error you should try to nail down. See, uh, so you're saying you're using 0.2 ounce, you're using one fifth of an ounce of onion on that hamburger? I don't believe it. A slice of onion is probably more like an ounce and you're not gonna get a pretzel bun for 11 cents. So I'm saying you're 20, 30, 40 cents uh, on the unrealistic low side, James. Wait, that's what, that's, remember I, I had asked you guys about that and you guys had at, said to use the pretzel bun price as the, like the brioche bun price because it would be pennies on the, on the dime or whatever. Okay, so are you saying that that pretzel bun costs 11 cents? That's, that's, saying, what we, that's what the inventory sheet tells you? The, there's, no pretzel, there's no pretzel bun on the inventory sheet. It was like the brioche bun or something like that. And so, you guys, it's, so you're getting the, the 11 cents from another product? Yes, Chef. Okay, yeah. I get it. I understand. Well, I'm just telling you, you're not going to buy a nice anything bun for 11 cents. Let me go take a look at the hamburger buns real quick. It could be as simple as take a wild guess and say, let's try 30 cents and see if that's more, you know. Hamburger buns plain, they're $25 a case, but they're, I think I have a, in one of the inventories, I do have a, a Kaiser bun instead. That'd be more in lines with what you're looking for for your, um, for your pretzel roll though. There we go. 
They're forty-one dollars a case. For how many? Uh, same, same, same pack size. I don't know what that size is. <laughs> same pack size as 10, 12 count. Sorry? A 10, 12 count. So 10 times 12, 120? Now this is, this is a little bit lower. So the Kaiser buns, they're bigger. So you look at about a five, uh, 12 count, uh, six, 12 count. Six packages of 12 per case. 41.85 a case. 41.85 divided by 72 is gonna be something like 60 cents a bun. Uh-huh. And there's another one, the Kaiser Bun Brioche, 82.25 a case. So there's two kinds you can utilize for to uh, improvise and utilize the price to sell the, the pretzel bun. You can use a Kaiser Brioche instead of the, the Kaiser Buns or the regular hamburger buns because the regular hamburger buns would be a lot cheaper. The uh, brioche is going to be more in line with the pretzel bun because the pretzel buns are more heavier. They come in less per case and they're going to be a little bit more expensive because there's a little more labor that goes into it. Well, James, that's just a decision you got to make. And I probably need to pull out of this and let you work at it now and work on some other stuff with some folks. But there you go, 67. There you go. And I'm telling you, I, you're not getting your onions for one penny and you're not getting your tomato slices for one penny. And you're not getting your lettuce for two pennies. I just think you need to rework a little bit here. Yes, Jeff. And, and I think it's probably because uh, I think it's probably because you have uh, you're saying that your uh, your lettuce is 11 cents an ounce, I, I or 11 cents or something. I don't doubt that, but you're saying you're using 0.2 slice of lettuce, not two slices of lettuce. You're saying you're using 0.2. Just look at your numbers, right? The the whole mistake in that case could be. Uh, oh. Your, your decimals in that column of value, right? Yeah. yeah. So check that over, put real numbers in there and see how your cost changes. And that might be something, and that might tell you a different uh, price that you should sell it for. I think you'd be a lot happier with it. Yes, Chef. Okay, I see what you're saying. Thank I'll, you. I'll let you have it for a little bit. Okay. I keep like normally I have my screen to where it's set up with the inventory sheet and then the spreadsheet. And I keep thinking yours is the one that I'm clicking on, Chef, because I only have the uh, cost sheet clicking up. So I keep going in and out of Zoom. Uh, yeah, I'm just doing stuff like that too. Chef Miguel, I was trying to re remember how this goes. Um, a four pack of parsley, uh, and it says size one pound for fourteen dollars. That's fourteen dollars for a four pack, and that's total. That equals one pound. Four whole, four whole packs of parsley equals one pound. So, so four packs is the parsley that already comes uh, uh, no stem. It comes uh, the little stem, the leaves, and they come in a pillow bag. A cellophane bag. It was like four bunches, right, Chef, in that package? Right. Okay. And that, that whole that whole four pack weighs one pound? Correct. Not one pound for one pack? No, it's one pound per pack. So it's four yeah. pounds for a case? Correct. Okay. Thank you. So redoing that gamer burger, like Chef Gary suggested, and checking my math a little bit, the iceberg lettuce, how much does it come, how much in a pack? Like, I know it's 24, 
It's 2408. It says, but it just says iceberg. There's probably a case of 24 heads. There's probably about a buck a head. Yeah, 24 in the case. Okay. And then, so from there, I would, like, I, I wouldn't, that's what, I think that's what's getting me, is like, I'm trying to figure out how much each yeah. one, each individual portion would cost. Yeah. So that's, I, go ahead, okay, Chisel. So iceberg is 2404 a case. Divide that by 24. That's how much one head cost. Okay. Now, try to picture in your, in your mind how much a one head weights, maybe 10 ounces. So you yes, take yeah. that 24 divided by 2404 divided by 24 is so like about a dollar head. So dollar divided by 10, that's how much one ounce will cost you. Now, how much are you going to have in your hamburger? One or two ounce of lettuce? Uh, I, I change it to like a half a half ounce. Okay. So a half ounce would be like one small little leaf. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you got a, if you got a, um, say eight out, uh, eight ounce head of lettuce and it's a buck. So the, the lettuce is costing me about, um, 12 ounces, 12 cents an ounce. Yeah. So my math was somewhat right then. Yeah, you're about right. So on your thing earlier, I think you had a penny for iceberg lettuce, but if you got 12, 10, 12 okay. cents, you're in the range now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And here's another thing too, guys, this is for everybody listening to this conversation. You know, you can't, you can't say exactly that, that iceberg lettuce could be eight ounces one week. The, the next week, that same head of iceberg could be 12 ounces or a pound because they, they grow it tighter. They grow it looser. They, they har harvest them earlier. Um, they're just depending upon how much water is coming up that's in the ground and so forth. They vary a lot. So what a restaurant does is they'll take two heads of, of, of iceberg and they'll either tear it in leaves that are appropriate for hamburgers until take all the way, all the waste and cut out the stump and, and do all the prep. And they'll stand there literally and count two leaf, two leaf, two leaf, two leaf until they know exactly how many little two leaf portions they got out of it. And they can do the math, right? Simple. Sounds silly, but it's simple. And people would do that. The other thing they can do is they can shred that stuff like taco lettuce with a cook's knife or on a, uh, um, a deli slicer and rinse it and drain it and measure it in a gallon pitcher and say, okay, I got, you know, five quarts of uh, shredded iceberg lettuce here and I'm going to use one quarter cup, two volume ounces of shredded iceberg every time I sell a hamburger. That's another way to get to the cost too, right? You can do it however you need to do it. You can design your own math here. So if I had five quarts of shredded iceberg from a head and that head cost me a buck, I'd be paying 20 cents a quart for shredded iceberg. That's pretty cheap to me. I think that actually, you know, but I could, I could do the math. 20 cents a quart for shredded iceberg. So 32 ounces in a quart divided by 20 be about a penny and a half an ounce. No, it'll be less than a penny an ounce in that case. Hey, James. Yes, what's up? 
you were saying something earlier to Tia about um, searching the inventory. I wasn't really paying attention. What were you saying? Um, so if you're using uh, Google Sheets instead of like the actual Excel, because I don't know how to do it in the actual Excel because I haven't really messed around with it. Mm -hmm. But in uh, Google Sheets, the three in the top right hand corner, uh, there should be three vertical dots. If you click those vertical dots, mm -hmm. um, it should come up with uh, like a little drop down menu. And the first thing on that drop down menu is a find and uh, should say find and replace. Hold on, buddy. Okay. And then right, uh, so you type basically, right in you there. just how to scroll the documents for the specific item that you're looking for. Exactly. Okay. All right, great. All right, thank you, James. No problem. What else, guys? What do you guys got? I'm just doing a couple of chats right now with some folks, Chef. Okay. Uh, trying to get, I got some people, some folks seem to be moving along pretty good on the costing thing. Daniel, I got a chat coming. Daniel uh, Bolton, I got a chat coming. You wait about a moment here. Hey, Chef, you see that chat from Daniel Bolton on cost of uh, artisan bread? Okay. I, I could take a wild guess and say if you're buying it, paying some fancy bakery for it, they're probably charging you four bucks a loaf, right? Just about. I think there was some in inventory, too. Oh, okay. Let me, let me take a look real quick right now. I see some ciabatta for thirty four sixty five for... I can't quite see how much, but yeah, they're gonna be about give or take three or four dollars a loaf. That's one inventory. I'm gonna take a look at another inventory. 
flat bread, wheat, Pullman hamburgers, rolls. Okay. I think I'll look at the other one, see if I can find it. Oh, Daniel, if you made that artisan loaf, I mean, you have your labor cost, but just the food cost itself, I could guess it's going to be in the neighborhood of a dollar, a dollar and a quarter, just the food cost to make it. That's pretty good money-wise on the food ingredients, but of course, there's the labor dollars, right? Yeah. Daniel, are you hearing me? Okay, maybe not. I might have to put a response in the chat. And uh, Shaheem said he's shared with us too, but I haven't got nothing yet. I'll check mine, Chef. It's, and, it's uh, loading. It's like loaded. I'm gonna have to resend it because like the Wi-Fi here is trash too. <laughs> I'm, 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 not, I'm not trying to make it like sound like an excuse, but I'm gonna send it. I know. I feel you. There's a lot of pain around know, yeah. this week so far. You know. Here we go. Okay. Uh, it's not exactly artisan bread, but it's um, similar to what he's looking for. <clears throat> uh, where's that at, Chef? Right here on the um, uh, first uh, food inventory, the, the one that is massive. Um, forget what it's called. Uh, copy of inventory, month end master. In the frozen section, on the breads, you got bagels, blueberries, cinnamon, plain jumbo, baguettes, batards, uh, boule, cranberry, orange, mini, uh, pumpkin, uh, baguette, flatbread, plain, focaccia, quarter sheet, focaccia, tomato, basil. I see a uh, rustic car break loaf there, Chef. That'd be a nice part of some bread. That's the one. 20 in a case, 15 ounces each, 34 bucks. Uh-huh. So 34 divided by 20, Daniel. That's your, uh, that's your answer right there. 34 divided by 20. A little over a buck and a half, not bad. Yep, not bad. Yep. Some of that frozen bread product that you could buy and proof and bake or just buy it and just blast it for a, a heat up because it's already fully baked. Some of that stuff is really surprisingly good. Yeah. Like there's a lot of pe people that are bakers that they ought to bake something that good one time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we do, we do the croissants. We do the croissants uh, like that, chef. Like they come frozen and all we do is we set them, set them on a sheet pan yeah. I, I caught most of it, Danny. I, I caught most of it. You said that you, you buy them frozen, you proof them, you bake them, about 30 minutes come out pretty good, right? Yep, exactly. So, Ms. Kaylin, I got your recipe cost card. You know you can uh, load up the rest of them in the same same uh, spreadsheet in a different tab. Just copy the whole thing. Uh, that's actually the only one I have right now, Chef. That's okay. the only one that I'm working on right now. No, but still, you can, um, yeah, I just uh, insert another sheet. I'm going to copy what you have and, and put it on the... Um, on the second sheet, okay? Okay, I see what you're saying. Yeah, that way you have to like do one individually and send it. You can do the same ones in the same um, spreadsheet. Okay, gotcha. Okay, what do you want? Okay. So, Danny, I was kind of taking a, a guess there to say that that uh, if you're making your own artisan bread, you spend about a buck and a quarter to make it. I might be wrong or, you know, wrong a little bit this way or that, but now you're looking at buying one for a buck and a half. 
it, to my wow. mind, in some operations, it'd be really hard to justify making them if I can buy them for a buck and a half. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. Like, my whole, especially on a food truck, like, that's the whole whole thing with, with the ideal of my food truck is I'm not just trying to serve some slop. I want it to look elegant and Sure. And, you know, portable, but um, sure. I want I want most of the ingredients to be as fresh as possible. But I mean, if I'm getting frozen bread, you know, artisan bread for a dollar seventy a loaf, then right. why not get the frozen? And and in in the case of a truck, you got a freestanding restaurant. You 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 may have some. You can make some baking space in your kitchen or you probably can or it'll, it'll kind of have some kind of space where you can do that in a food truck that could be a different world in there like i mean you might could do it but you might really find like wow it's really really tight space wise you know and i know that i know they used to have full service kitchen cars on trains heaven's sake but they had the they had the money of the railway operator to design and build cars that were highly specialized to use every square inch like a ship would use, you know, like, like being on a ship where there's not, no, no wasted space, you know, so yep. on a food truck, well, there might be some pretty well-designed food trucks out there, but I wouldn't be guaranteed that everyone's going to be super easy to, to make that much space inside. No. All right, I gotta go check around, see what else is being shared with me right now. So there you go, Ms. Kelly. Just copy two on the, um, uh, inserted two more sheets, two more tabs, copy the whole recipe cost card, and rename your um, blue vignettes on the bottom tab as blue crab vignettes. And on sheet two, it's the same exact recipe. The only thing you're going to do is just take off all the uh, information that you have here and leave it blank for your next recipe uh, buildup. Without deleting your, um, uh, formulas. Tia, are you there? Tia, are you there? So sheet two, uh, there is a, that's another um, blank recipe cost card, Ms. Kaylin, on your spreadsheet. And I went ahead and took out all the information, left all the formulas there, then touched that one. Now that was ready to be utilized for whatever recipe you're going to build it for. So sheet three, you can do the same thing. Uh, erase the ingredients, amounts, volume, the name for the recipe cost card, uh, servings, and you can uh, use that one for the next recipe. And how do you go about it? Just on the on the bottom left, see the little plus um, um, little button. Click on it; it'll insert another tab. Just copy and paste, and keep on building as you go. Okay, perfect. I was just about to ask how to do that. <laughs> okay. So here, you follow me. I'm going to insert the next one, right? So I'm okay. at the bottom left with little plus um, key. I'm going to mm -hmm. hit that key, and it now it creates a sheet number four on the bottom tabs. I go to sheet number two. Okay, a highlight from um, row number 42, all the way down to K and all the way down to the top. Uh, copy it, go back to sheet four, same thing. Go to uh, cell number four, 
um, all the way down to K. And then paste it. When well, you have another um, recipe to work with. Perfect. Sorry, my internet cut out through most of that, but I got the gist. Okay. Yeah, so the bottom left, the little plus sign, click on it, and it uh, inserts another tab. Um, go to the sheet number two, which is a blank recipe cost card. Uh, mm -hmm. Click on the cell uh, roll number 4142, highlight a little bit to K to the top, copy, go back to um, the sheet four, the next tab that you inserted, and then highlight the same rows, and then paste it, and there you go. Perfect. You don't have to build another one from scratch. It's just copy and paste. Thank you, Chef. You're welcome. Go ahead. Okay, on the rice noodles, you got it's the total cost is thirty six fifteen, but it doesn't have an ounce or pounds or so. How would I figure out like for my drunken noodle uh, soup with they, shrimp? They usually about twenty four packs of in a case and the one pound pack. So you take that okay. number, divide it by 24, and divide it by one pound, and divide it by 16. That should give you an ounce. Okay, so. They come in at uh, one pound uh, packages and 24 in a case. So you take that dollar amount, divide it by 24, divide it by 16. That should give you a uh, price per ounce. So the dollar amount divided by 24 is how much a package costs, and we know it's a pound, so then you're going to go the package cost divided by 16, and that's your ounce cost. Yeah. Okay. All right. I got it.
<laughs> I don't think so, Ms. Mercedes. I don't think you need to make the cells smaller. When I was looking at your recipe cost card for the uh, vegan basil pesto pasta, uh, mm -hmm. I was having an issue with plugging in the formula. Yes. Look, uh, looking at it, um, the top, if you're looking at the basil recipe, the ba vegan basil pesto pasta, your yes. dish price, that 282, right? If I'm mm -hmm. looking at it right now, is sitting at J21, right? The way okay, so yes. But it's not. It's on uh, I21, not J21. That's the thing. I think I may have to use J because I've used I so far because I'm looking at the formula that you have plugged right now uh -huh. and it shows I21 divided by 0.3, which should be the formula. Right, um, the 0.3 is a 30% food cost, suggest so the retail mm -hmm. price. Yeah, but it's saying I and not J, but I'm working in my Excel spreadsheet and it's not letting me input that formula. I'm going to try again. Just a second. Just like uh, when I was trying to uh, figure out your food costs, I had the same issue mm -hmm. because you know when I was trying to you know plug in the food cost percentage, if yes. you look at that at that sale right on um, that particular sale is, is J twenty three, but if you look at the formula, it is I twenty one, which is two eighty two divided by J twenty two. So two different formulas, twenty one and twenty two because. The 282 is on I-21, not a J-21. Yeah, no, I get that, Chef, but because those cells have been merged, uh -huh. I think that's what's causing the issue. I'm not sure. I'm going to try again to plug the formula in. Yes. Um, go ahead. So when, when they are merged, let's say mm -hmm. you merge I and J, right? Yes. You merge them. Use I, don't use J. Okay. And that should All work. Right, so... I'm going to try again. Now for this particular formula, did you use the mod? Because that's what I'm using. The mod? What mm -hmm. mod? The formulas, that's how they have them um, saved in the system. Yes, I use the formulas, uh huh? Yes, but see, this is saying it's not a number. <laughs> <laughs> so it's pulling it from the different, um, different cell. Okay, just a second, let me see something. No, that's not what I want. Okay, so I'm gonna try just a second, I, 21, okay, divided by, I-23. <laughs> okay, now that is completely off. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, well, just a sec, because it's saying, um, as we discussed, I'm using that 21% food cost, but when I put in the formula, it gave me for the retail price 0 0.02, which it shouldn't be at that. It should be 14.1. So I must have done something incorrectly and I'm gonna try to figure out what that is. So for the food cost, should I be putting, and let me look at, okay. So for this one on um, the Google Sheets, I see you have it as 30.00, but did you also um, mark it as a percentage um, as far as that particular cell? Did you format it as a percent or did you just enter it in that way? No, um, if I want to plug in the formula, it gave me a dollar, a monetary sign. I had to go back to the top and uh -huh. hit that, that percentage um, icon right next to the dollar sign. Yeah, so it is formatted as a percentage. Uh -huh. Okay, so I have mine formatted as well. I may need to change something around. Um, let me see. Maybe I need to put 
those zeros in there like you've done. All right, so let me undo this just a second. And remove that formula here. Let me percent. Okay. And I'm going to try this again. Give me just a second. So on which recipe are you on right now? I'm I'm on the basil pesto, but I'm using it in Excel and not on sheets. Okay. Just just a second. Um I think I may need to add in those zeros. So let me take a look. Now you can go up and down the zeros too. You can downsize them or leave them as this, um, right next to the percentage. Mm -hmm. You can go to the left and give her the zeros, just like I did on the Google Sheets. And just give you that uh, three zero percent. That's it. Now okay. thirty point zero zero. I'm trying to see, no, that doesn't appear to make a difference. Let's see. Uh, this is giving me the blues. I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all, it all depends on the um, where that, that initial um, this price total is at, like I said, it's uh, when I look at the recipe, it looks like it's under J21, but mm -hmm. in reality, it falls under I21. So when I was trying to, when I figured out the retail price, you know, I had a hard time. So I had to go figure out where that 282 was sitting, what sell, not a J, it was sitting on I. So I did, did um, you know, equals I21 divided by 0 0.30, and it gave me the suggested retail price, so $9.40. Now to figure out the food cost percentage, that was another tricky part. It wasn't cooperating with me, I think about four or five times until I figured, okay, figure out that I was using the wrong sales to plug them in. I was pulling J21 divided mm -hmm. by J22 and it wasn't giving me nothing. And then I made a mistake of not putting equals first and then uh, J divided 21 by uh, J22 and it still gave me nothing. So I looked at it up close Okay, the 282 is sitting on I-21, not J-21. So I pulled, I typed in equals I-21 and then uh, divided by J-22 because the 940 is sitting on J-22, not I-22. So two numbers, two different uh, roll of sales. I know that's what I'm doing, Chef, but it's not working with me at all. And I know I'm plugging the right numbers because for this particular one, it is the formula that I have in is going to be I-21 divided by I-23, which in reality should bring back 14.1 because I've done the math with my calculator. But each time I plug in the formula here on the functions tab, it brings it back to 0 0.02. So that's what, I'm not even sure what, what that is at all. So on, on this, in this uh, cost cut that I'm looking at, there, there is nothing on there, uh, 23. 23 is, uh, it, mm -hmm. it has, 
the um, no and that's because you're looking at the google sheets right yeah and i have mine on my excel document okay so i think there's a disconnect somehow you're I, on the google sheets right now right i can see you well i was i clicked on it but okay. Like I have the formula down. I know what I'm supposed to be doing and I know what the answer, the correct answer is, uh -huh. but getting it to function correctly in Excel is an issue. And, and Excel is the same thing, same thing as the Google Sheets. It's uh, pro probably the wrong cell number or um, letter that you pull in there from and not, it's not giving you the correct answer. Or well, the, let me see. What are you trying to figure out right now? Um, the retail price. Okay. So you take uh, 282, which is I-21. Yes. And then okay. divide it by I-23, which is the food cost percent that I have listed. And no. I've clicked on the cell just to make sure that I am, in fact, entering the correct divisor. Um, but it's still giving me... Yeah, it, 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 if you if you divide the dish price by the food cost percentage, it's not going to give mm -hmm. you anything. Okay. You need to divide it by your retail price. Then it'll give you the food cost percentage. Okay. So you take two eighty two and divide mm -hmm. it by the retail price, which in this case you can sell it for fourteen ninety five, and they should give you the uh, food cost percentage. Okay, but I thought, okay. So. so you have the dish price, right? 282, we, we, stay, uh, we, um, we say this on I-21, right? Mm -hmm. And your retail price is sitting on J-22? Mm, yes. Okay, so on the retail price, type in 1495 if you have it. So type in 1495. Okay, so let me erase this function first. Okay. Okay, so that gave me an error message. It says there are one or more circular references where a formula refers to its own cell either directly or indirectly. That's weird. Yeah. So you have 282 on 921 and retail price is J22. So you typed in 495 on that one? Mm-hmm. And it give you the reference. Yep. Did you erase the formula or you left it on? No, I did. I erased the formula each time I try to plug a new one in. Uh -huh. So but now, if, if you utilize J22, go ahead and, and um, let's do this, this, this step right here. Go to okay. I-22 and plug in 1495 on I-22. Okay, so that's, I have the 1495 in. Okay, now on I-23, Mm -hmm. Type in equals I-21 divided by I-22 and hit enter. It's given me a dollar amount of 19 cents. <laughs> Okay, so I changed it to percentage, and okay, it's showing me 19% for go. that cell. That's it. Okay, so the issue was I was using the actual functions tab. 
to actually plug the menus. That way I could just transfer it across, but it appears I'll have to enter these. But here's the thing, Chef. So I'm setting my own food cost percentage. Uh -huh. And then I'm using the percentage that I imagine it to be to come up with my retail price. Okay. No, because that's, that's what just happened. Because like we had um, discussed for this particular dish at 2.82. Right. With a 20% cost. Uh-huh. So that would be 2.82 divided by 0.2, and that would give me $14.10. So we rounded up to the $14.95. Correct. So if I were to do instead, which this is showing me once I've entered in the formula, that this would give me a food cost percent of 19. So I'm just, I understand the math behind it. Mm -hmm. It's just plugging in the formulas, that's an issue. Yeah, um, the formula should, uh, once you get the first couple of ones done, uh, the next mm -hmm. ones are gonna be a lot easier. And you can take this, this um, recipe, um, mm -hmm. Oscar, not the whole entire recipe, just the bottom cells where you plug in the formulas, hi uh, highlight them, Copy mm -hmm. the paste on all the rest of the recipe cost costs across the board on the same exact location, same exact uh, rows of cells, and the, and the formula should be plugged in for every single one of them as you copy paste each one. You don't have to plug them in individually as you go. I'll do that for most of them, but some of them go outside of these uh, margins because some of the ingredients lists are pretty lengthy, mm -hmm. but I'll definitely plug it across um, the ones that I can that yeah. end in 22 and that end in 23. Yeah. All right, so I've got it. Yeah, so it doesn't matter if it's like 21 or 31, as long as you copy and paste those, those formulas on each one of the mm -hmm. recipe cost cards and they should be, make your life a lot easier. Okay, I just needed to get that down so that I can move on. <laughs> okay, and I've got it. <laughs> I should be good from here. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chef. You're welcome. <laughs> What else we got? Are you holding this, dear? I'm fine. Okay. How you doing, Nick? I'm doing good. Oh, my computer's a little slow right now, so. So, Nick, do you have your uh, menu downsized, uh, rewarded, and redone? Reformat it? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. How do you know your recipe cost cards, Ms. Yosey? All right, how about Ms. Aubrey? How are you doing the cost cards? Hi, 
I'm just starting mine today, Chef. Okay. I updated my menu and I sent it to you and Chef Gary before I saw class. It. I have it open. Looks good. How do you do, Ms. Mallory? Uh, I was going to ask the raw cost, is that for like, what is the raw cost for? The raw cost is, is what it takes for you to make that recipe. So let's say you're okay. doing a, a hamburger, right? You buy the hamburger buns at the store that cost you $4. They come in 12 in a pack. You figure out how much one hamburger and one costs you. Same thing with the burger patties, the lettuce, tomatoes. And you plug in the hamburger bun, the burger patty, lettuce, um, tomatoes, mayonnaise, whatever goes on the dish, uh, one each or ounces, and then the cost of it and the recipe cost card is going to tally all that up and is going to give you how much uh, it costs you to make that hamburger. That's the raw cost. Okay, because I was looking, I with I have heavy cream in one of mine and I only need like two or three tablespoons. And the only thing I'm finding is like quarts. I didn't know if the raw cost was like the cost the whole quart or just the few tablespoons in it that I'm going to use. The raw cost of the heavy cream is a whole quart. Now, uh, two tablespoons is, is like one ounce, just about that yeah. one ounce. So you take about, you take the, the quart, 32 ounces. Uh, I forget what price it is. It's like seven some dollars a quart. So you take seven divided by uh, 32, and that's your price, your raw cost per the one ounce of heavy cream. And then you can plug that into your recipe. Okay, okay, okay. And then the cost to serve is, uh, would be, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to look at it too. Your, your cost to serve is um, suggested at 30%, but you're gonna finalize the price according to what price you're gonna sell your menu. Um, so let's say that hamburger is gonna cost you five bucks to make. You're gonna sell it at 12.95. Uh, you know, according to the comp uh, competition around you, now you take that five dollars divided by two ninety five, and that should give you a food cost percentage. Okay. Some items are going to be in the up, uh, upper thirties, so I'm going to be in the lower thirties or below thirties, and that's okay. At the end of the day, the overall menu uh, food cost is going to see what you're sitting on. Okay. So you do, you do have the both inventories, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Because I know I remember having heavy cream on, on those uh, both inventories. I can't survive without heavy cream in my in my kitchens. Hey, hold on, Ms. Josie. How's the costing going? Um, starting off, I had some issues with my computer and logging in and it's updating and stuff. Um, 
But so on the cost cards, I know that you um, were saying that we needed to add different tabs for each one. So just create one and then just keep adding tabs at the bottom instead of just like doing one and like having a space and then just keep going down. So just keep adding tabs instead of just adding to one page or to one sheet, I guess. Uh -huh. It makes it a lot easier. So you have one tab, one recipe cost card, uh, go to the bottom, hit the little plus section and insert another tab copy and paste and keep on going. So you have like this row of, of folders, I mean, sheets along the way. Um, okay. The sideways, yeah. Instead, okay. And still waiting for yours, Mr. Shaheem. I guess your internet is not working yet. I'm I'm redoing it because I guess it didn't like save to my file because the Wi-Fi wasn't on or something. So I got to redo it. I'm halfway through with it though. You'll get it by the end of class. Okay. Shaheem, are you sure it didn't get flipped over into it? Uh, you you might have two Google Drives that you're working in there. But sometimes I used to, when I was a student and I had that, you know, do my work and it would disappear and I'd later I would in, my, in, my, in the drive that's on my other account. So like my school Gmail had a, uh, a drive and my personal Gmail, ha Gmail had an account and it would disappear and then later on I found out it flipped over into the other drive. Okay, let me, let me check that thing because I've got multiple emails. Yeah.
Mr. Christian, do we have, do we get a menu from you? Oh. Are you asking me? No, no, Christian. Do we get a menu from Christian? Chef Miguel, yes. about how many onions are in the 25-pound bag? 25-pound bag, they're about, what should we say, 10 ounces each? So you take 25 pounds, right? Yeah. So a typical amount, 25 times 16 ounces in a pound. That's a total of 400 ounces. Divided by 10 ounces, you're looking at about 40 onions in, a, in the bag. Sounds about right, Chef Gary? Yep. You were take? Yeah. Sometimes they'll be huge, but if you say jumbo yellow, yeah. it'll be about 10, 12 ounces. When you if you if you specify jumbo yellow when you order them, they're gonna be 10, 12 ounces. Okay, Chef Miguel. Uh -huh. um, I have lost myself somewhere. And to say this without using a cuss word, I have messed up some stuff. So. Tia, are you missing some work you did? Like, you, like it disappeared? No. <clears throat> I'm not even going to be fun, like lie right now. I, would, I was in the middle of doing my formula and I completely went blank. So the, when I look at the inventory sheet, it says for a case of six 10 pound cans of black beans, it's $16. They're not 10 pound cans, they're number 10 cans, but that's okay, six number 10s, 16 bucks? Yes, six okay. number 10s, 16 bucks. Okay. All right, let's take a look real quick. Okay, so that's where I messed up at, so help me fix it. All right, so let's look at the canned goods and this is the dry storage, okay? You follow me? 
Mm -hmm. Okay. Here we go, black beans. $26.13 for a case of six. Where the hell do you see that at? On my screen? <laughs> <laughs> Line uh, cell number 402. Nah, I'm not on that one because I printed it out because I couldn't keep flopping back and forth. Cell number what though? Uh, 402. On this uh this uh spread on this inventory. So twenty six thirteen dollars divided by six. Each can is four dollars and thirty five cents divided by ten pounds equals forty three cents, forty four cents a um a pound. You're looking at about three cents an ounce of black uh, canned black beans. And I need twenty three ounces. Okay, so, okay, but, so, there must be a, hold on, because I'm messing myself up somewhere. What do you want? Hey. What do you want? Nothing. When you hate me, you want something, so what do you want? Okay, so I have another question. So did you only send one inventory sheet? Did you send like one when the class first started and then sent another one? I think I sent them both at the same time. Which one do you have? Okay, because the one that I have, it has the black bean six number tens for $16. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's an older inventory. So yeah, I'm looking at that one too. That's row 474. It says black beans, uh, six 10 pound uh, case, $16. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little bit older inventory. So go for the, go for the ones I just give you that by three cents an ounce. Okay. If you don't have that one, I'll send it to you right now. I just shared my cost card cost card with y'all. I don't know I don't understand why it's putting like fifteen thousand dollars for stuff. It says my raw cost is thirty five thousand dollars. And I don't know how I did that. Uh okay. Let me <laughs> let me take a look at it real quick and figure it out. <laughs> There you go, Misty. I just sent it to you, okay? All right. <laughs> okay, $35,000. Whoa. What? Yeah, your butter, it's at, uh, let me see, D7. by B7, okay, I see now. So, uh, Ms. Mallory, um, I don't know if, if, you, if you're, you can see what I'm doing right now, but on your on your volume, on your butter, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna type in, um, 
four and twenty-five. I forgot you needed to do decimals with some of this. Right. So it brought down your cost to nine cents on the butter. Same thing on the vanilla uh, bean. Okay. Uh, half a cup, so 0. 0.5. And it brought down your cost to 14 cents. Uh, okay. Heavy cream. I uh, will go just right in two. There we go. So the total cost per entree is 58 cents. Okay. Thank you. That makes sense now. I was so confused. I was like, I don't understand how it's doing that. And uh, same thing I just did with my Caitlin on the recipe cost card. You can build on this one too, but um, you know how? Uh, I think I, I have it copied. I just have to go through and copy and paste them. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, but decimal points, definitely. And with like the vegetable stock, do I need to make a cost card with that? Or if I'm going to like make it in-house or if find you make it in house, Usually it's from the vegetable scraps that don't go to waste, but you can also make it to cost out a recipe. Well, let's say you're going to make a gallon of vegetable stock. You'll take one onion, uh, one celery, maybe a couple of carrots, maybe some garlic, some herbs. Total cost of the uh, uh, vegetables, maybe $4. So... Okay. $4 for one gallon um, and then go from there. Yeah. Uh, Chef, I'm, I'm fine with just, you know, coming up with a kind of a ballpark idea like that for the purposes of this class. If you're doing a restaurant, when you really do a restaurant, you'll probably cook up a batch, you know, strain it off, see what the yield is. And then you really have the real number, but I don't think you got to make up a whole new cost sheet just to, just to come up with the cost of some vegetable stock in this class. Okay. Yeah. And they use a number across the board. Um. Okay. I think honestly, I'm gonna just go to my phone place tomorrow and just get a Wi-Fi box. Cause I just got off the phone with my mom. They got they issue out little Wi-Fi boxes you can have. Anyone got Verizon? Y'all should look into that also. Yeah, yeah. I don't do Verizon, so I don't know. I do the AT and T. <laughs> but still, you know, have issues too. I got kicked out a couple of times in the internet.
Uh, that's an expensive vegetable stock for a cup. <laughs> How much? Dollar twenty-two for a cup. I can make lobster stock for a dollar twenty-two a cup. <laughs> so let's take a dollar twenty-two for a gallon. Okay. Gallon. So, yeah. So one twenty-two divided by one twenty-eight times eight, and that's your price per cup. Mm -hmm. So one twenty-two divided by one twenty-eight, or times right. one twenty-eight divided by times eight. So one cup of vegetable stock is about eight cents. All right. There you go. That's it. <laughs> That may be your ahead of the game. No. Did it leave us or Gary? No, Chef, I'm working on try, trying to make sure I contact all the people that are going to be in our uh, Chef Pablo in my uh, culinary arts class next week because I'm going to make a decision about um, how they're going to receive their product. No, I mean, Danny B, did you leave us? Oh, Danny B, I don't know. Um, that kicked out or what? Have to see here real quick. Yeah. I mean, they're looking at supposed to be cost cards. He's got them all laid out. Missing maybe one or two. That's about I it. Feedback just now, too, Chef, on just some little small menu details and stuff. I want to see if uh, if I have a response on that. So Gary, have you got anything from uh, Christian? Well, I got a menu from him a while back. I haven't, let me see, uh, I haven't seen anything new tonight. Would like for him to see your face as well? Uh, let's see here, what was I just checking on? Checking on, see if I got it heard back from Danny B. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't have any email from Danny. I'm going to check on him right now, Chef.
So Ms. Kaylin, I don't have uh, veal sweetbreads on the inventory sheet. Either one. But they are about 49 bucks uh, a pound. Let me, Is that 49, Chef? Let me go back. It's 25 bucks a pound. 25 a pound for sweetbreads? 25 bucks a pound for sweetbreads. Wow. They're not cheap. That's something I will not be buying. Yeah, something hunting hunting for us. Like, I know I had I, I, I had them, but um, for Valentine's Day, not on the regular menu. So only, you know, buy them like once a, once a year. Yeah, they're $49.99 for a two pound um, case. So there's about 25 pounds, um, $25 a pound. Okay, Chef Miguel. Mm -hmm. So on this inventory, you have Idaho potatoes at twenty five fifty eight, but it doesn't say how many. Fifty pound case. 
50 pounds? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you.
Yeah, so as we continue for tomorrow, um, my, my words of advice will be to keep on plugging in your recipe cost cards as much as you can. Any chance you get, open them up and go at it. Uh, we're going to continue again tomorrow. Tomorrow's Wednesday. The goal is to at least have them done by Friday. Have been done by Friday, so over the weekend we can go over the uh, on Friday we can go over the uh, schedule, the labor forecast. It will tidy up by uh, Monday, Tuesday, and then Wednesday and Thursday we'll be going over your project, your final projects, see what um, um, you guys have produced. And again, you can uh, build a slide if you want to uh, to um, present your project, or you can leave it as is. As long as we get your menu, your schedule, your recipe cost cards, and your overall food cost percentage, and your overall labor cost percentage too. So again, today is Tuesday, tomorrow's Wednesday. Let's keep plugging away. Don't stop. Um, we'll dedicate, I guess, again, about an hour or so tomorrow lecture and we'll keep on working on the recipe cost cards. If we can't find the price, uh, we'll either improvise something that is equal about the same value. If not, we'll find it as, as we go along. Just like we figure out about the sweet bread, the chicken wings, the potatoes, all that information is on there. Um, those of you guys who have not submitted a menu and the recipe cost cards, uh, you need to get on the ball as soon as possible. Time is ticking. Time is ticking. It's coming around the corner. Fridays is going to be real here real quick. Okay, guys. This is it. Week five. Yes, I'm excited to find out to see you find a project. Some of the menus as I read them, I was like, damn, I'm hungry. <laughs> yeah, so they look good. So just let's keep it up. You guys have any questions for us? Barbecue my place this weekend. Hey, BYOB. <laughs> nah, I got it all. I see orange <laughs> juice, milk. <laughs> right? All right, you got some any questions? Leave it open for the next five minutes. If not, uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow. Like I said, keep on plugging those numbers. Uh, don't stop. Try <clears throat> to hear sooner than you think. Tomorrow's Wednesday, right? Week five. You got to? Yes, Chef. All right, deuce. Um, Chef Miguel. Yes. Um, I have a question.